In the year 60 AD, the Roman Empire has taken over most of Europe except for Britannia, which still resists. On the island of Mona, the Roman army arrives to kill 300 Druids, slaying them one by one without mercy. But even in their last moments, the Druids never stop believing that one day their mythical warrior goddess will save their people from the Romans, so they die praying on their knees. Later in Rome, Commander Paulinus reports the latest massacre to King Nero, commenting on the Druids' legend of a warrior goddess. Nero agrees they can't allow the Druids to find a savior, so he issues a decree that forbids all women from holding a position of power. Meanwhile in Britannia, the Iceni tribe is living in peace under the leadership of King Prasitagus and his queen, who are the proud parents of two young girls. One morning, warrior Kieran informs Prasitagus that Rome has sent a new procurator called Catus, who doesn't like Britannia much. While the men discuss politics, the queen takes the girls to language classes and a cosmetic session. Once they're all nice and pretty, they make their way to the market, only for the girls to get disturbed when they find a bunch of men killed on crosses. At first the queen doesn't see the big deal since she thinks they're criminals that got their sentence, but her maid corrects her, those dead men are actually Christians that Rome killed for their beliefs. The queen refuses to be intimidated and takes the girls to the market anyway. While they look around, they notice a group of Trinovant warriors having a drink. Suddenly Cardamonda sees the queen and kneels before her as she calls her Boudica, the name of the warrior goddess. When they hear that, the other warriors kneel along, but a stall owner hears the maid explain the goddess legend to the girls in protests in the name of Rome. The man tries to grab the queen to take her to the Roman guards, but Cardamonda immediately cuts his hand and then decapitates him. Afterward everyone runs away before the Roman guards can find them. Sometime later, Prasitagus explains he had to negotiate and bargain with the centurions to prove his wife's innocence. For around a year, the queen isn't allowed to return to the market, anything she wants she must send a servant for. Then the queen asks him why the Trinovant warriors saw her as their goddess, so Prasitagus guesses it's because of her barbarian blood. In the afternoon, the queen plays with the girls using training swords, but it's clear none of them have proper training. Prasitagus soon joins them while Kieran announces he's leaving, and the queen notices he's been in a constant broody mood since he lost his family in the war. Then she teases her husband with a wooden sword, which makes Prasitagus think the barbarian blood in her is stronger than he thought. Since obviously the queen can't leave her origins behind, Prasitagus decides to gift her the dowry her father gave him when he married her, it's the Boudicca sword, which was forged by forgotten magic and protected for centuries by the druids. Its color changes with the flickering fire. The next day, Procurator Catus visits the Iceni tribe and Prasitagus has no choice but to kiss his ring. They have a nice meal together and the locals pretend to be honored by Catus' presence, but they're clearly uncomfortable by his passive-aggressive comments toward their culture and his admiration of their fort, which implies he wants to steal it from them. Afterward, Prasitagus orders his men to be well-behaved because Catus can choose to destroy the village over the smallest mistake. He asks Kieran to round up a bunch of bandits and undesirables to send them to Catus as tribute as an indirect way to show him the lands are dangerous and hopefully kill any ideas of him settling down here. Kieran obeys his king, but he doesn't like the idea. Sometime later, Prasitagus leaves with his men to catch all those bandits for tribute. After a few days they come back but Kieran has bad news for the queen. While they were fighting the bandits, they were ambushed and Prasitagus died in battle. The queen has a total breakdown and sends the men away, yelling at them for not protecting their king. The next day, since there are no male heirs, the Iceni tribe declares her their new queen leader and gives her the royal torque that marks her as such. Kieran doesn't look too happy with this decision. The ceremony is suddenly interrupted by Catus and his men, and he explains the Roman Empire doesn't accept women in positions of power and that now he considers the tribute they sent him a bribe. Because of these two crimes, Catus will take all her land and she will be punished together with her daughters. He also reveals that Kieran was the one who told him Prasitagus' location so that his soldiers could ambush him. The soldiers immediately drag the queen away from her daughters, throw away her torque, and tear off her clothes before hanging her on a tree, where they proceed to flog her. As the queen is hit over and over, the tribe can only watch, because those who try to protest are held down by the soldiers. After the punishment is over, they brand her face with Nero's initials, an act usually reserved for slaves. In the evening, Cardamonda and the Trinovant warriors sneak into the Roman camp and silently kill a bunch of guards until they find where the queen is being held and take her away. By crossing the river, they manage to move unnoticed and make it to the Trinovant tribe, where they take care of the queen's wounds. While she rests, she suffers a fever and keeps asking about her daughters, so Cardamonda has to tell her the Trinovant tribes are her children now. The queen refuses to accept it, but thankfully at that moment the girls enter the tent and reunite with their mother. Cardamonda also gifts her a set of fake teeth that she stole from a centurion because a warrior must be able to bite. A few days later when she's finally feeling better, the queen leaves the tent and discovers the warriors are training her daughters to fight. She asks them to take a break so they can spend some time together and learns that Cardamonda used to have children too, but they were killed by the Romans. The girls also explain that in the eyes of the Trinovant tribe, the Mark Catus gave her brands her as their leader and that her duty is to bring the tribes together to fight the Romans. The girls even tell her that she has no choice. Later, 
The queen decides to train with a dummy, but her movements are clumsy. Luckily one of the warriors joins her and guides her on how to hit correctly. Their training session is interrupted by Cartamanda, who brings her the Boudicca sword. Apparently Cadus had given it to one of his soldiers and Cartamanda killed the guy to recover it. The queen is incredibly touched by the gesture, but her trainer comments that bronze isn't a good metal for a sword. At that moment, Wolfger and his tribe arrive to meet the queen. Wolfger isn't impressed by her lack of experience and proper armor, saying he should be the one leading. He then proceeds to make fun of her sword and breaks it in two before throwing it into the river. The queen rushes to jump into the water to recover the sword, which worries the warriors because those currents are strong enough to drown a person. However the queen comes back and shows the sword magically fixed itself, which impresses everyone and causes them to kneel as Wolfger announces she can depend on him and his men. The queen raises her sword and finally accepts the name of Boudicca. In the evening, the warriors recover the royal torque as well and do a ceremony that officially welcomes Boudicca as the new queen of the United Tribes. She offers a heartful speech about regaining their freedom and mentions they can ambush Carta's convoy in two days. Wolfgar is skeptical because Cardus has a powerful army and it'd be like walking to their deaths, but Boudicca makes her sword float back to her hand before leaving and everyone sees it as another sign. While Boudicca is in the forest ready to fight alone, Wolfgar shows up with his men and they accept to help her fight while chanting her name. Two days later, the convoy is crossing the forest while being led by Kieran, who is now part of the Roman army. They find Boudicca alone in the middle of the road and she asks to parley with Cardus. At first Kieran tries to ignore her request, but she threatens with great violence until he goes looking for his boss. Cardus shows up and doesn't recognize Boudicca, so she takes the chance to remind everyone that she's the queen of these lands before calling her sword and killing Cardus with quick movements. At that moment the tribe warriors come out and surround the Romans in a very successful ambush. Soon there are fights all over the area as the Romans try to defend themselves or run away, but Boudicca's men are ruthless and kill every single enemy they put their eyes on. Boudicca sometimes loses her foot or her sword, but she never gives up and keeps going until there isn't a single Roman left and their heads are impaled on spikes. When it's all over, the tribesmen take gold and anything useful from the bodies. Two warriors find Kieran trying to get away and bring him to Boudicca, and the mere sight of him makes her so mad that she starts stabbing him over and over for his treason. A worried Wolfger has to pull Boudicca back before she loses her mind, and she announces they'll ride for Camulos. Wolfger thinks it's a good idea, but they'll have to get a blessing from the Druid Council first. In the evening, the Druids give them their blessing by making Boudicca and Wolfger drink from Cata's skull as tradition dictates. After the blessing is done, Wolfger tries to flirt with Boudicca even though he already has two wives, but she turns him down because she still considers herself to be the wife of King Prasitagus. After Boudicca is left alone, another druid comes to talk to her about the meaning of life. She tells Boudicca that her daughters actually died and she refuses to accept it. Boudicca starts thinking about all the family's memories together as the druid explains that her daughter's spirits will always be with her and that she'll die soon, but first she must lead her army again. Upset by all these revelations, Boudicca leaves the shack to ask Wolfger if he can see her daughters and he confirms they're just her imagination. This causes her to have a breakdown and pass out. Moments later, Boudicca wakes up in a bed and sees her daughter's spirits by her side. This time she knows they aren't real, but she still appreciates their support and promises they'll reunite soon. A few days later, Boudicca and her army arrived at Camulos. This town was occupied by the Romans after they murdered all the locals and made it a retirement settlement for their senior soldiers. It's easy for Boudicca's group to invade the town and kill all the Romans because of their old age, causing a complete massacre with heads decapitated included. The fight is over in just a few moments, and after they've taken anything valuable, they set the whole settlement on fire and Boudicca announces they just got started. Later after they've set up camp, Boudicca notices the warriors are celebrating in a very peculiar way. Wolfger explains they are getting the same mark she has on their cheeks as a way to pay tribute to her, which upsets Boudicca because the symbol equals slavery. However Wolfger points out they can't read, so they're giving the symbol a new meaning. When they make it to Cambridge Forest, they ambush another Roman convey and dozens of soldiers are killed with no mercy. The more they fight, the more coordinated Boudicca's army becomes but also the more vicious, and heads are decapitated left and right. Later in London, Boudicca's army attacks the harbor in the middle of the night and burns down their enemy's ships. The Roman soldiers try their best to hold the line, but there's nothing they can do against these furious tribesmen and Boudicca takes great pleasure in decapitating their captain. Meanwhile in Rome, riots are taking over the city and buildings are burning down. People aren't happy with how costly war is and are demanding a victory. Paulinus tries to rescue Nero, but the king explains he's a musician, not a warrior. He feels that Roman has forsaken him, so he decides to self-delete. Paulinus is devastated to see his king die, but he swears to bring the victory that Rome needs and tells his troops they'll be sailing in the morning. Soon the news of Nero's death and Paulinus' trip reaches Britannia, and the tribesmen are worried because the king's army is more powerful than average guards. Wolfger has a chat with Boudicca, explaining that the tribesmen need to recuperate and that winter is coming. Fighting now would mean walking to their deaths, so he thinks the best course of action is to return in the spring with more men from the north. Boudicca refuses to send her men home, 
saying they need to finish what they started. The spirits of her daughters point out that Wolfger is probably mad because she turned him down, but Boudicca still doesn't want to lay with him even if it's for the greater good. They can't reach an agreement so Wolfger takes his men away, and Boudicca is left with only the Trinovant tribe. The next morning, the tribe gets ready to fight and they learn that Paulinus is making his way to Watling Street to meet her. Boudicca is eager to go, so she gives her tribe an encouraging speech and kisses the land, promising to get back their freedom. The tribesmen run toward the road to start their attack, but to their shock, the soldiers move out of the way to let them pass. Paulinus is an experienced strategist and has prepared the perfect ambush with dozens of archers that soon open fire and start killing the tribesmen. Horrified, Boudicca orders her men to turn her carriage on its side for protection, but it's pointless, many of her men are still fighting and they keep dropping like flies. Boudicca tries asking her daughters for help, but the girls explain her time is finally over and she must join her family. She decides she doesn't want to die like a coward and Cardamanda shows her support, so Boudicca gives her orders and everyone comes out to go down fighting. At that moment they hear screaming from the forest and discover that Wolfger has come back with his men to help, surprising the Roman soldiers from behind and using their own crossbow to fight. Romans start falling all over the place, but their numbers are still greater, so soon both Wolfger and Cardamanda fall in battle. Boudicca suffers from seeing these deaths and furiously kills as many Romans as she can, but her daughters remind her it's time to reunite with her family. While she's distracted by their spirits, Boudicca is hit by an arrow and the Romans take the chance to surround her, killing her with multiple stabs. As she dies, Boudicca thinks of her family and her soul reunites with them in the afterlife. At the present time, there's a statue of Boudicca and her daughters in London. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.